Welcome back to machine learning. This video is going to cover the limits of learning. It's a little bit early in the semester to talk about all kinds of limits. And we'll actually talk about limits of different learning algorithms and models throughout the semester. But it's good to get a head start on this so you have an understanding of what can and cannot be learned. And then we can have a discussion of limits throughout the semester based on this shared background. First, we'll talk about inductive bias. An inductive bias is the bias that we come into the problem with. Basically, in the absence of data to narrow down the relevant concept, what types of solutions are we likely to prefer? Right? We all have our own inductive bias based on our background and our understanding of the problem. The best way to go through this is actually to use an example so you can understand this concept a little bit better. Okay, so I have some data. I have two classes, two different sets of data, okay? The first class consists of words, and so does the second class. The first class is abase, abort, abuse, adopt, alarm, agree, and align. And the second class is bakery, ballot, banker, barber, bruise, battle, and bodice. So this is all the information that you have. So now you have to build a model so that if I give you some sort of test sequence, some sort of test word, you need to tell me if it belongs to class one or class two, okay? Well, if I give you this test data, right, if I give you these words to test with, affair, analogy, award, babble, beg, and based, where do they go, right? What class do you choose for them? So it turns out, right, it's obviously very ambiguous. It turns out that class one could be verbs, or it could be words with length less than or equal to five, or it could be words that start with an A, right? And class two could be nouns, words with a length greater than five, or words that start with a B. So depending on kind of what you chose, and there could be other options, but depending on what you chose, you would assign each one of these test words to a different class, right? If you decided that how you were gonna split it was based on starting with an A or starting with a B, okay? Then one, two, and three would go to class one and four, five, and six would go to class two. But it would be a completely different split if your classifier or your decision was different or based on different information. So this is gonna be sort of your inductive bias. What you decided to classify each of these test samples as is your inductive bias for this particular problem. Every model has an inductive bias, right? Every model that we choose for machine learning has an inductive bias. We have inductive biases. So what is the inductive bias for a decision tree? Well, if it's shallow, then it doesn't get to ask that many questions. So it makes sort of simple decisions or decisions based on simple questions. And if it's deep, it makes really complicated decisions. So it takes way, probably way too much information into account when making its decisions, right? So these are the biases associated with shallow and deep decision trees. Models have bias, we have bias. We take data and we convert them into features for the model to learn from. So we introduce bias as well. So think about any time where you've had uh, an opinion, right? and you've heard from both sides on an argument and you're open to listening or whatever, right? And then you decide to in, you know, investigate it yourself, a lot of times you'll just go with what you had already thought was true, right? Something that had already aligned with your inductive bias. So we do this all the time. So in this sort of context, it's more referred to as a confirmation bias, but basically just expecting your opinion to be confirmed and inductive biases is, is very similar in that way. And so we have our own inductive biases and we are choosing models and training models based on those biases. Moving on, not everything is learnable. There are many things that a model simply cannot learn. Noise is one of them. Sometimes the features may be insufficient for learning. Sometimes there are ambiguous labels. And sometimes the inductive bias of the algorithm is so far away from the problem that you're trying to solve that you can't solve it. 
Okay, let's go through each one of these in turn. Noise may prevent the model from learning. Noise is something in the data that is incorrect for a variety of different reasons. There can be noise at the feature level and at the label level. Right, so if we're considering the medical domain, we could have some sort of MRI or some sort of scan here as a features, right? And if someone moves during an MRI, it comes out kind of like this. So it's a little bit messed up. So that would be feature noise, right? So it's not exactly precise as you wanted it to be. And so there's some noise in the features that can cause problems. So if we start talking about instead label noise, right? If someone is supposed to go through a full data set of birds and label exactly what type of bird it is, sometimes mistakes get made. So someone might say, oh, you know what? This is a, this is a morning dove, right? And this is also a morning dove. Okay, but only one of these is a morning dove. I don't even remember which one it is. One of them is a turtle dove and one of them is a morning dove. So again, I'm not, a, I'm not a bird expert. So either way, a lot of times labelers will make mistakes. So it's important to keep that in mind that a lot of times when you're working with a large amount of data, you will have some label noise. Sometimes the features are insufficient for learning. So there's just not enough information. If you had access to a large data set with many patients and each sample had the following features, sex, height, and weight, it would likely not be enough information for you to predict the likelihood of someone getting lung cancer. Features that would be more important would be like family history and maybe smoking history and some other features. So again, if you're predicting cancer risk and the only information you have is height, hair color, eye color, and age, that's not really enough information. Another issue is that sometimes the labels can be ambiguous, so it can be kind of a subjective problem. So if you think about search result filtering, right, what is offensive to one person might not be offensive to someone else. So the model would need to be person specific in order to handle that because it couldn't just be a general purpose offensive versus not offensive. The other issue is that um, sometimes the inductive bias of the learning algorithm is too far away from the concept that is being learned. Um, this is a real problem. So if you're talking about a depth one decision tree uh, to identify if someone is likely to get into a car crash, um, this probably won't perform poorly. This will not perform well because there are many different factors that go into whether or not someone's going to get into a car accident or a crash. Some other important concepts are underfitting and overfitting. So underfitting is when you had the opportunity to learn something and you didn't. And overfitting is paying too much attention to idiosyncrasies in the training data. And so you're unable to generalize well. These concepts are very important in machine learning. Underfitting is basically right when you had a chance to learn something and didn't. So you, it's just poorly fit. Okay. Um, overfitting is when you just did a little bit too much. So if you're looking at this data, you're thinking, okay, there's probably like a parabola type shape associated with this because there's some noise that moves the data up and down. And that's exactly what the just right figure looks like, but a straight line isn't quite complicated enough, and this ridiculous squiggly thing is way too complicated. Okay, so we don't want to overfit because then we're just learning noise. Uh, we also don't want to underfit because we don't want to just be lazy and not learn anything. We're basically always trying to avoid overfitting. We need to set aside some data for testing. Okay, so we're actually going to take data anytime someone gives us data and we're going to split it into three sets, training data, validation data, and test data. We are never going to touch the test data. Test data helps us to know how we will do on future unseen data. So how do we use it if we never touch it? The idea is that you train your model and then you hand it off to someone else who then runs it on the test data. That way you never see it, because if you see it, you'll change your model to perform well on it, which then doesn't help you address the issue of overfitting. Okay, but if I never get to see the test data, then how does it help me during training? It doesn't really. So we actually separate the data into three sets, training, validation, and test. Sometimes 
the validation data is called development data, but I absolutely hate that. And so I just want to let you know that because it might be in the textbook, but almost everybody calls it validation data. You don't touch the test data, but you use the validation data to see how your model is doing while it's training. So the model does not train on the validation data. You just use it to periodically test the model. So you're training the model on the training data, right? And every now and again, you stop training and you take your model that as it currently exists and you test it on the validation data to see how you're doing. You typically separate the data as 60 to 70% for training and 10 to 20 for validation and 10 to 20% for test data. Model parameters. Much of machine learning is done with the modeling approach. We choose a formal model of our data, modeling the classification of a particular problem as a decision tree. The decision tree model is our choice. Models have parameters. We use the data to decide these parameters. What are the parameters in a decision tree? The specific questions that we ask, the order in which we ask them, and the classification decisions at the leaves. All of these things are decided by the data. Hyperparameters is a whole other thing. There are these parameters that the program must set. They're called hyperparameters, also parameters that control other parameters. One for the decision tree is maximum depth. Adjusting the hyperparameter allows us to go between underfitting, an empty tree, and overfitting, a full tree. Hyperparameters don't have a good definition, but they can be easily spotted. They're not something that can be adjusted using the training data. So the hyperparameters for a decision tree, typically maximum depth, right? How do we choose a hyperparameter? Do we choose it such that the training error is minimized? No, because if we do that, then we'll be overfitting. So we actually look at whether or not the validation error is being minimized. And that's sometimes how we choose hyperparameters. We can run our algorithm with every possible setting of parameters, evaluate each on the validation data, and choose the one that does the best on the validation set. That's it for limits of learning. The next topic is going to be geometry and nearest neighbors.